This is a lesson on temperature change and heat capacity in the heat and thermodynamics unit. In a prior lesson, we explored the different heat transfer methods. From this point on, we are going to explore the results of heat transfer. So transfer of heat can result in one of many physical changes. When energy is transferred, we see that it causes a rise in temperature. The coherent mechanical energy of the entire object is converted to incoherent mechanical energy of the individual molecules of the substance of that object. Kinetic theory says that an increase in incoherent mechanical energy of the molecules results in an increase in the temperature. In order to study an increase in temperature, we need to think about the substance. What is interesting about substances is they do not give out heat or take in heat all at the same rate. Different substances have what we call different specific heats. And by specific heat, the definition is the amount of heat required to change one kilogram of a mass by one degree Celsius. This is an intrinsic property of a substance, much like density. All gold has the same density, all gold has the same specific heat, okay? It's related to the substance's resistance to gain or lose heat, which I will leave for upper division or graduate study for you. And we can see over here that many of the different substances have different values. The units is energy per kilogram degree Celsius, and we can see that up here. We need an amount of heat, which is joules energy, one kilogram and one degree Celsius. So overall, when we multiply those things together, we're going to get a heat out. The values over here, you can see that there's various values. We have solids, other solids, liquids, and gases. When we look across these values, we can see that some are high and some are low. Some accept and give away heat well, whereas others do not. They have higher specific heats. This is in joules and it's in calories, so use whichever is appropriate for the problem that you're using. I wanted to take a second and talk about terminology. There's a few terms here that sound similar, but because we're working in science, they have very specific definitions, and I wanted to cover this just real quick in case you got confused. Specific heat is the same as specific heat capacity, and you will see the word in here, specific heat. And what it's referring to is how much heat per unit mass per unit temperature. Heat capacity in general, when you think about heat capacity without the term specific there, it depends on the amount of mass present. For instance, molar heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise one mole of a substance, one degree Celsius. So that's a molar heat capacity. So watch out here. If you're working with specific heat, that's in kilograms. If you're working with molar, that's with number of moles. And we'll look at this on the next slide. The last thing I wanted to talk about on this slide is the specific heat of water. And by water, I mean the gas, the solid, and the liquid. The, the molecule H2O has different specific heat capacities depending on the phase. And you can see that on here. I can find ice. Here is the specific heat capacity of ice, 2090. When I look and I look, see water, it's 4186 and steam is 2110. All of those are different phases of the same molecule, and you see that the different phases cause a change in the specific heat and how much energy it takes to raise the temperature of one kilogram of that object by one degree. Water is interesting. Notice that water, liquid water, has the highest specific heat capacity on the chart. And thus, it should not be a surprise that that is a liquid that we use to control heat. For instance, water is used in the radiator of your car. Of course, you put some antifreeze in there so the water doesn't freeze, so it stays water. But it re water can absorb a lot of energy per unit mass. So it's going to absorb a lot more energy before it changes temperature. There's a reason why we use water to moderate temperature.
We can quantify heat transfer and a change in temperature with this equation here as an object gains or loses thermal energy. So make sure you determine whether your Q is a plus or a minus. If it gains, it's positive. If it loses, it's negative. Of course, that will correspond to an increase in temperature or a decrease in temperature respectively. Q is heat in joules. We have the mass of an object, the specific heat of the substance, and the change in temperature. Over here we have an alternate form. This is the number of moles. I have this down here, the number of moles present. The molar heat capacity, not the specific heat capacity, but the molar heat capacity, and the same term delta T, talking about the change in temperature. Notice that delta is always final minus initial, no matter what quantity you have. So in this situation, we will say delta T will equal T final minus T initial. Sometimes this will be a negative value if you decrease in temperature, so watch out for your signs. And again, units on this, Q is in joules, mass kilogram. The specific heat is in joules per kilogram per Celsius degree, and your temperature can be in Celsius. Notice that the specific heat is in Celsius, so you want the temperature to be in Celsius. Let's look at a few examples of this equation in action. I picked a very simple one to begin with, just to calculate a simple quantity from this equation. We have cooling blood. Blood can carry excess energy from the interior of the body to the surface, where energy is dispersed in a number of ways. While a person is exercising, half a liter of blood flows to the body's surface and releases 2,000 joules of energy. Okay, so I'm noticing some things in here. A liter is a volume, so I'm going to write down the volume of blood is a half a liter, and I can convert that as I need to. The amount of energy released is 2,000 joules, and I'm going to note that that is a release in energy, so I'm going to have a negative sign on this amount of energy, causing a decrease in temperature. The blood arriving at the surface has a temperature of the body's interior. I don't know if you're familiar with the temperature of the body's interior. Uh, the temperature of, for instance, the liver inside is 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 37.5 degrees Celsius. So we're going to use that as our initial temperature of the substance that we're looking at. Assuming that the blood has the same specific heat capacity of water, so specific heat capacity of water, little c for water, is 4186 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. That was on the table on our previous slide. Determine the temperature of the blood that leaves the surface and returns to the interior. So if we're losing energy, we're going to have a decrease in temperature and we will be able to calculate from this equation. So let's work on this equation a little bit. I want to solve for T final, so I'm going to say delta T equals Q over MC. So when I find T final minus T initial equals Q over MC, and that means T final equals T initial plus Q over MC. I'm going to note that I want the heat capacity, specific heat capacity of water. I need to calculate the mass of the blood based on the volume here. I have the initial temperature, and I will be calculating the final temperature. So let's work on the mass of the blood. They give me a volume, and I know that there is one liter is 0 0.001 meters cubed, so I can convert this to a volume. If I want to get to mass, I know how to do that. Density times volume is mass. So if I know the density of blood, and I do off the top of my head, I know the density of blood is 1060 kilograms per meter cubed. My volume is going to be 0.5 times 0 0.001, and I'm just going to put those quantities down in here. So I get Ti plus Q over rho blood V blood C water, which we're assuming is the same as blood.
Okay, so it looks like I'm ready to plug in values. My initial temperature is 37.5. I'm gonna add on Q, which I know is negative. Remember, we have that negative sign there, so I have negative 2,000, and I'm going to divide by the density of blood, 1060, the volume of blood, which will be 0 0.5 times 0 0.001, and then the specific heat of water, again is 4186 joules per kilogram per degree celsius okay so when i run these through the calculator these numbers i get 37.5 minus 0 0.9015 degrees celsius so we're losing a little bit less than a whole degree here as the blood moves from to the surface and then back to the center so t final when it leaves the surface will be 36.6 degrees Celsius. And if you're curious what that is in Fahrenheit, that's 97.88 degrees Fahrenheit. So we definitely see a cooling going on here. I chose the second problem because it is a classic example of putting two objects together and allowing them to reach a final common temperature at thermal equilibrium. It says, what will the final temperature of 204 grams of 20 degrees Celsius water when 365 grams of 91 degrees Celsius iron nails are submerged in it? Okay, so we're going to take these two substances. One is cooler at room temperature. The other one is hotter. Uh, not near boiling water, but pretty hot here. And they're going to come to some final temperature at thermal e equilibrium when we put them together. So it says the specific heat of iron is 0.12 calories. So I'm noticing I'm in calories. Calories per gram degree Celsius. And that's okay because we want to find a final temperature here. So we're calculating a final temperature. We'll just keep that in mind. Uh, the specific heat of water. Uh, the specific heat of water is 1 calorie per gram degree Celsius. That's sort of the definition of calorie how much energy it takes to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. I'm going to write out a chart here of our information. Seems like we have a mass for the substances, we have an initial temperature for the substances, and we have a final temperature for the substances. And we're going to have the iron and the water. So I'll put the water here and the iron down here. The water has a mass of 10, 204 grams. The iron has a mass of 365 grams. The initial temperature of the water is 20 at around room temperature. The initial temperature of the iron is 91. The final temperature is we don't know. And it's a common final temperature for both of them. They're both at the same temperature at thermal equilibrium, and that's what we're solving for in the problem. So I can si kind of see what's going on here. How I'm going to approach this problem is with conservation of energy. An assumption we're going to make is that there's no energy lost to the environment and there's no energy gained from the environment. So whatever heat that the iron loses, the water is going to gain. So Conservation of energy says delta E equals zero. So the heat gained plus the heat lost has to equal zero. Of course, there's a minus sign in here. I'll say Q gained equals negative Q lost. And you can see that that makes up when you add them together, it equals zero. When I think about these two things, the water is gaining energy and the iron is losing energy. So when I think about the heat loss and gain and think about masses and specific heats and change in temperature, whatever the water gains, the steel, the iron will lose. So let's write some equations. Um, the heat gained by the water, and I'll write this, Q water equals M water, C water, delta T water. The heat from the iron is going to be M iron, C iron, delta T iron. And I'm going to expand the delta T out. And remember that T final is the same for both of them. So I don't really need a subscript on T final. It's a common one. So I'm going to get M water, C water 
T final minus T initial water. That has to equal negative mass iron C iron T final minus T initial iron. Okay, so we're finding the final temperature and I'm going to note that is in two places in this equation. So I'm going to have to do some algebra to manipulate this around. This may be a point where you find comfortable to plug in numbers and maybe that may help you find do the algebra, but I'm going to go ahead and do this symbolically. An easy way to do this is to divide by the mass specific heat term on both sides. And um, I think I'm going to divide by, um, why not, uh, M water, C water on both sides. M water, C water on both sides. M water, C water. So there's nothing on this side, and it's all encapsulated in this one term. Your inclination may have been to distribute this inside and that wouldn't be wrong. Uh, it's just a different technique in algebra and you may see that my equation or your equation may be a little bit easier but this is what I'm doing here. So I get T final minus T initial water equals M and iron C iron over M water C water and I'm going to distribute this negative sign to both of these T's in here so I'm going to get T initial iron minus T final. Of course I'm going to distribute both of these terms the MC over MC to both of these terms T final minus T initial water equals M initial M iron, C iron over M water, C water, T initial for the iron, minus M iron, C iron, M water, C water, T final. Okay, so I'm trying to get T finals on the same side together, so I'm going to take this term over to that side and this term over to that side, and I'm going to leave some room here, so I get T final plus... M iron, C iron over M water, C water, T final. That has to equal T initial for the water plus M iron, C iron, M water, C water, T initial for the iron. Okay, so we're getting some place. I can factor if there's a coefficient of one out front. It's kind of those that invisible hidden one there. Uh, so then I get overall this equation is going to be T final equals T initial water plus M iron C iron over M water C water T initial iron. So that's one whole term. And then it's going to get divided by 1 plus this term M iron C iron over M water C water. Okay, so not the simplest equation, but um, not terrible. I calculated this term M iron C iron over M water C water as a fraction, right? It's just a fraction here, and I get 0 0.21471. And so that's going to make my calculations a little bit easier. I'll put this over here. So I get T final equals T initial for the water, 20 plus this term here, which is I know this 0 0.21741 times T initial for the iron times 91. So I'll multiply those together before I add them to 20. And then I'm going to divide by 1 plus this term here. So 1.21741. Okay. So when I multiply this stuff together, when I take this term times 91, I get 20 plus 19.538, and then I'll divide by 1.21741. And overall, I get the temperature, the final temperature of these iron nails and the water mixed together is 32.55 degrees Celsius. So that's the final answer. I'm going to highlight again a few things that I did. I made my table to keep my information kind of organized. That may help you. 
Another thing is this conceptual analysis up here that I did conservation of energy. Whatever heat was gained by one substance had to be lost by the other substance. And in that way, we have a closed system. Remember, we have different types of systems. And here, we definitely have a closed system. There's no heat gain or loss with the environment. Whatever the one substance loses, we assume that it came from the other substance. So... I set that up here and I noticed which substance was gaining heat and which substance was losing heat. I kept my negative sign tracked and so when I multiplied through I didn't get some weird negative or um, value. I didn't lose my negative sign. So when you approach these sorts of problems you have an example to go off of. Sometimes these problems get easier for instance if you mix water with water the two specific heats are equal to one another. And then when you get one specific heat over the other, it would cancel out to one. And you would just have a ratio of their masses. Sometimes you do equal portions, and that may make the problem easier if mass of one equals mass of the other. That would cancel the unity as well, and that would make your calculation easier. So watch out for those things. I did a little bit more complicated of a problem just to give you an idea of how to do this. But it could be that the problems you're given are made a little bit slicker. But you're ready to go on a more difficult problem, which we will see in phase change. The last problem I chose here is another example of conservation of energy, where we take heat and convert it to mechanical energy rather than another type of internal or thermal energy. It says truck brakes used to control speed on a downhill run do work. Okay, so we're thinking about brakes doing work. On a downhill run, we have some sort of kinetic energy and we're losing potential energy, right? So we have some sort of loss of potential energy and it could go to kinetic energy. That's typically what we see. And I can write this out. Kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial plus any work done has to equal kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. So what's happening is that there's converting gravitational potential energy to increased internal energy of the brake material. This conversion present, prevents a, the gravitational potential energy from being converted into kinetic energy of the truck. So if we have some sort of potential energy, typically it gets converted to a kinetic energy. But what they're saying is we're going to take this potential energy and convert it to work done by the brakes such that it's not going into kinetic energy. The problem continues, assuming a temperature increase due to complete frictional heat transfer to the brakes, calculate the temperature increase of 100 kilograms of brake material with an average specific heat. If the material for the 10,000 kilogram truck descending 75 meters at a constant speed. So when I see constant speed, and when you see this too, when it says constant speed, you know V final equals V initial. That means the initial kinetic energy term and the final kinetic energy term are equal to one another, so I'm just going to cancel them on both sides. And so you see what's happening is that some sort of initial potential energy plus the work done by those brakes is zero. And what they're saying is the work done by the brakes is getting transferred to heat, the internal energy in the brakes. So when I think overall of some sort of energy, right, the work done by the brakes plus this heat gained by the brakes has to equal zero. There's no loss or gain of energy from the system. We're thinking about a closed system such that the work done by the brakes is the negative heat gained by the brakes, right? The brakes do work and they go into heat, okay? So I would say this is more of a maybe appropriate way to think about it. The work done by the brakes goes into this heat of the brakes, the internal energy of the brakes, okay? So that's why I have a negative sign here. Potential energy initial minus the heat has to equal zero, right? Because work equals negative heat. And I get the potential energy initial equals the heat. And when I think about this, what's the object that has potential energy? The truck. So I'm going to need to make note that whatever goes on this side is the information from the truck. 
what's gaining the heat? The brakes are gaining the heat. So over on this side, I'm going to put any information pertaining to the brakes. So I'm going to write out what I know about potential energy. I'm going to have mass times gravity times height. Well, I know gravity. They give me the height. And over here, I want the mass of the truck. Okay. Over on the other side, I have the brakes gaining heat. And here's the term for their rise in temperature. We have the mass of the brakes, the specific heat of the brakes, and the change in temperature. And that's what we're looking for. Uh, calculate the temperature increase. So I don't care what the actual value are, is. I'm solving for delta T. And I made note of this truck and brakes on both sides because if you wrote these masses without the little sub symbols here, you might think that it's the same mass and cancel on both sides and don't do that. That's not what you want to do. We see that it depends on how much potential energy is gained or lost, which depends on the mass of the truck. And then only the brakes are absorbing all of that energy. Only the brakes. Not the whole truck, but only the brakes. Okay. So looks like we're ready to put in some numbers here. Uh, 10,000 times 9.8 times 75 goes on top. And then the mass of the brakes is 100. And the specific heat of the brakes, they give us that over here times 800. Okay, so we have some things canceling here. Overall, when you calculate this, the change in temperature is 91.875 degrees Celsius. And I say degrees Celsius because that's the unit on the specific key here. It just has to come out that way. 91.875 degrees Celsius. That's the change in temperature. So whatever temperature the, the breaks were before, we could say room temperature, 20 degrees outside whatever it is outside you add on about 92 degrees which would take it over 100 degrees but remember these are breaks so they have a higher melting point than water and they won't melt uh, they may be smoking this is a situation where it could be like the break gets really hot and starts smoking um, and that would explain why brakes smoke is because they're absorbing all of this mechanical energy. If you're hitting the brakes and you're going constant speed, all of this potential energy that could go into kinetic energy is being absorbed into this brake material as heat. And that's what degrades your brakes and why you have to buy new brakes or why brakes would smoke is because they get hot. So those are a few examples of how to do temperature change with specific heat.